Hello and welcome. I first want to thank the library for having me here today, but just as important, all of you who were brave enough to show up to talk about the bizarre history of Iowa from wherever you're watching this program from. So with that, let's begin. My name is Chad Lewis. I'll be your presenter for this program. And although my background is actually in the field of psychology, for the last 25 years I've been traveling the world in search of the strange and bizarre. Everything from hunting vampires in Transylvania, looking for mysterious creatures, crop circles, UFOs, weird people, odd places, you name it, if it's just strange and a little offbeat, I've traveled around the globe in search of these oddities. But what I discovered on my travels is that sometimes the weirdest things happen right in your own backyard. So that's what we're going to explore for this program. The bizarre history of Iowa. Most of the stories I'll be talking about today are from the late 1800s, early 1900s. Stories that were almost forgotten about bizarre Iowa. Now, if you listen to the rest of the country, they believe Iowa is weird in its own right. The rest of the country seems to believe that Iowa is nothing but corn, farmers who drive tractors down the road, that you're all crazy Iowa fans. And even though that last one may be true, I'm going to be talking about a different Iowa. A weirder, darker, and more bizarre Iowa. I'll be talking about some of the strangest stories from the past. So what exactly will we be exploring? Well, everything from bizarre deaths and ghosts, all the way down to psychic phenomena and UFOs. Of course, I've thrown in what I call keep in minds too. Things about Iowa you might not have known about the period we're discussing. For instance, in 1860, there were only about 600,000 people in Iowa. Today, over 3 million people call the home, uh, the state their home. Meaning back then, they had a lot more room to spread out and be weird. And believe me, they took full advantage of that room. First stop. Bizarre deaths. Now, if you open up your newspaper today and flip to the obituary section, you'll probably see a story similar to this. Old Man Lewis died peacefully, surrounded by his loving family. They don't tell you the cause of death, no details, no information. But the story in which I was finding these cases were a little bit different because the newspaper obituaries I was finding were something like this. Suicide is gruesome. Whole top of his head blown off by the blast. Quite a bit different than dying peacefully surrounded by your loving family. Which illustrates back then, they cared more about a headline and paper sales than the actual cause of death. Which is why you got all of these amazing old newspaper deaths, including this one. Fish escaped, poacher killed. It talked about a gentleman using dynamite to fish in the water. Well, I probably don't have to finish this story for you. You know how it goes. He actually dropped a stick in the boat, and instead of killing the fish, he met his end as well. Keep in mind, in the period I'm talking about, people were terrified of being buried alive six feet under. And it's a great story. It's a great legend, folklore. But was anyone ever buried alive? Well, yes, we know thousands of people were buried alive. We know this because we have thousands of newspaper accounts from the late 1800s, early 1900s. Back then, whether you were in a diabetic shock or in a coma, doctors would often pronounce you dead. But lo and behold, many people some of which were even at their own funeral, would pop up just in the time from being saved, from being buried alive. 
Now, this may seem a little silly today with modern science and medicine, but our great-grandparents were so afraid of being buried alive, they came up with several inventions. My favorite was this. It's called a cemetery bell, and it does or did exactly what it looks like it would do. It was a bell with a rope on a pole going down into your casket. So if you awoke in time, all you'd have to do is tug that rope, it would ring the bell, and alert the caretaker who lived there that you had been buried alive and they could come and rescue you. But there was one problem with this invention though. On many nights, the wind would set these bells off, giving the caretaker quite a scare, thinking everyone had been buried alive. It was also your responsibility to sit around your loved one's grave after they died to make sure that they didn't come back from the dead, that they were truly dead for good. Today, a lot of people love to get scared, whether it's a scary movie or an amusement park. They love getting frightened. But in the old days, getting frightened could cost you your life. I have dozens and dozens of stories of people who were frightened to death, such as this case where a clap of thunder and a storm caused this woman, age 76, to pass on. I have other cases where escaped horses and carriages caused death. People being audited for missing funds caused their death. People dropping dead when they heard their loved one had died. All kinds of ways to scare yourself into dying. But I'm going to move on from this topic. Not because I do not find it fascinating, I do. But because it's dangerous. I found dozens of stories of people merely talking about death when they drop dead. As though talking about dying was enough for the Grim Reaper to pay you a visit. So I'm going to move on to our next category while I still can. Ghosts and Haunted Places. This time of year, people often ask me for a recommendation of a scary book. Something to terrify them, to get them into the Halloween spirit. And since this is for the library, I thought I would go along this year. Because I do have a book for you to read. If you think you're brave enough, if you think you have what it takes, I dare any one of you to try to make it through the sappy love story Bridges of Madison County. This book is so scary they made a horror movie about it. But when you're done with the book and the movie, go to the Bridges of Madison County in Winterset. More specifically, the Roseman Bridge built in the 1800s, and right away it took on a reputation of being haunted. One legend tells of an escaped convict being chased out to the bridge. In some versions, they surrounded him only to hear a big boom, like a cannon going off, and the man simply vanished into thin air from the middle of the bridge. A more sinister version of events tells they caught him threw a rope up over the rafters, and took his life at the end of that rope. Regardless of whether either version's true, people had trouble going over the bridge at night. Farmers refused to go over because they would see mysterious balls of light hovering on the bridge. Horses refused to move as though they were picking up on some unseen force. Unfortunately today, you cannot take your horse and buggy over the bridge, but you can walk out there. Those who do still report hearing that big boom going off like a cannon, even though nobody's around. Others will see a ghostly image of a man hanging from the rafters while they're out there. He simply vanishes right into thin air. My advice is if you're going to go out there, do so at about dark because that's when the hundreds of bats that live in the bridge will come out and greet you and make sure you have a fun evening there. 
The people around Fort Dodge had no idea in 1893 that when they read this newspaper story about a bridge being haunted, that it would become one of the better known hauntings in all of the state. Right outside of Fort Dodge is a small town called Terra. This is Terra Bridge, except the locals call this one Terror Bridge. The old newspaper stories go back about a man working for the railroad pounding stakes into the ground when when one shot up and decapitated him. That was all it took for his fellow railroad workers, you know, big, strong, sturdy men who you wouldn't think would get spooked by anything, simply refused to cross over the bridge. Not only did they believe it was haunted by their uh, fallen colleague, they believed it was haunted by a phantom train. They would see the light coming toward them of the train. They could hear the rumbling of the engine. They could feel the train moving down the tracks. But the train never arrived. A lot of people have forgotten this story because a new version has taken its place. And the new version tells that many years ago, a distraught mother took her children out to the bridge. She had gone psychotic, lost her mind, and she waited. And she waited. Eventually a train came rumbling by and one by one she tossed her children over to the oncoming train where they met their death. When all of her children were disposed of, she jumped over and joined them in death as well. Now the legend tells that when you go there, not only will you see the ghostly images of those children, but the legend is if you do not park your car and lock the doors and windows while on the bridge, the spirit of that murdering mother will try to throw you over as well. The last time I was there, I was with noted researchers Noah Voss and Kevin Nelson. I was down below here. They were up above. Not only did they not lock their doors and windows, they came over to the side of the bridge. They were up above hoping that the woman would appear. I was down below praying that she would throw them to their death. But unfortunately for us, luckily for them, the woman did not appear. But it's also out on this road where many people have seen something that shouldn't be there. Something that couldn't be there. But yet, there it is, staring at them. What are these people seeing? Well... Maybe I better let you just take a look. This creature, for a lack of a better term, they called a werewolf. Said it was the size of a bear, but shaped more like a wolf with a long muzzle and this deep, dark, matted down fur. Most of the witnesses claim that it's a biped running upright on its hind legs like you and I do. But if you'd rather not go looking for werewolves and ghosts, you may want to do what other states do. Make their tourist attractions wineries or roadside attractions like a ball of twine or in my home state of Wisconsin, all the water parks. But you people of Iowa are a little bit different because you turn your tourist attractions from places like this, the Villisca Axe Murder House. Here you have the terrible story of 1912 with the J.B. Moore family. The family and their children, along with two family friends, were out and about for the day. When they were gone, researchers of the day believed that someone or several people snuck into the house, into a closet, or up in the, the attic and waited. And when the family came home, one by one that person or persons went room by room, killing every single person in the house. Now the good news is, or maybe the bad news, I don't know your macabre sense of adventure, but if you want, you can rent this house out for the evening. It's there and it's thought to be haunted. Those who stay there often see the ghostly image of a man walking down the steps to get to the main floor. Others hear all kinds of rapping and knocking on the doors and windows. Some claim to have seen the ghostly image of a man with a bloody axe walking through the house. Period toys left out will move about on their own 
as though thrown by some unseen force. Others swear they've heard the cries of phantom children, presumably the children who met their end so many years ago. But if there's one haunted place you're looking to go to, I recommend you head to Iowa City to Oakland Cemetery. Actually, I recommend you don't go here because the locals, they don't call it Oakland Cemetery. They call it the Black Angel of Death. There's so many variations about this story that when you go there, they have a little pamphlet telling you all the legends and lore about the statue. The statue was put there by a woman who said her husband was not faithful during life and he needed an angel to look over him after death. It was said that the bronze statue slowly started turning a darker shade of black every year from all the souls that it harvests throughout the year. Not only do some people claim that this statue will move and uh, change and shift throughout the cemetery, but there are many dares about whether or not you can go there and survive. Some of the dares are if you go there at midnight and touch the statue, you will die. If you kiss in front of the statue, you will die. If you are a virgin, you will die. If you're not a virgin, you will die. Basically, if you go to this cemetery, you will die. Lots of people have had mishap, misfortune, and all kinds of tragedies after visiting the Black Angel of Death. I love this category, medical anomalies. Today we could probably explain away a lot of these cases with modern science, but back then they had no idea what was going on, including this woman they called the Shark Woman. Out of Cedar Falls, 63 years old, when all of a sudden she started growing new teeth, just like a shark will grow new teeth. The doctors had no idea what was going on. As you can see, she had no teeth for several years, and then all of a sudden, new teeth started growing in to the shark lady. Keep in mind, the first screen door was designed in Iowa as well. Some of you watching might be a twin. You may have a twin sibling, and you might be a few seconds older than your twin, or maybe you're a few minutes or an hour younger than your twin. Well, that's all well and good, but what about being over a month different from your twin? That's exactly what happened to these twins in 1877. One was born December 15th of 1876. The other one did not join the world until the 1st of February of the following year. Quite a bit different than being a minute or two ahead or behind your sibling. I love this category because this is a category where science says these creatures do not exist, skeptics say they can't exist, yet every year people in Iowa were coming face to face with these oddities, including 1903, 20 minutes southwest of Des Moines was a small town called Van Meter. Van Meter was terrorized by a creature the newspapers were calling a monster of awful form, a winged monster creating a reign of terror. It all began late September one evening about 1 a.m. Local businessman was coming home late at night when he saw what appeared to be a light hovering above a building. He slowed down thinking it might be a bank robber or an intruder. When he came to a stop, the light disappeared and then reappeared on the other side of the street on top of a building in a matter of a second. Some say it flew across the street. The next day, nobody paid much attention to Mr. Griffith's story. That is, until that following evening, local doctor, Dr. Alcott, was sleeping above his office building when he was awoken in the middle of the night by a strange light flashing in his room. He went over to the window to see what was causing the light. And when he looked down onto the main drag of Van Meter, he spotted this creature standing there. Said it was seven to eight feet tall, 
had giant leather bat-like wings, a horn on its head that could project light. I have to give Dr. Alcock credit. He didn't just watch this thing. He grabbed his gun, filled with six shots, ran out and blasted the creature five different times before he ran back to the safety of his building. The next day, the town was split. Half thought it was a monster. The other half thought it was a hoax or a bank robber. One of those was the bank manager, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn left his family at home, went to the bank to protect the town's money from the robbers. About 1 a.m., he heard the sound of somebody strangling outside, choking. And when he saw a bright light flash into his bank, behind the light was a giant bat-like creature, seven feet tall. Mr. Dunn was so terrified, he shot out the window of the bank with his gun, his shotgun filled with buckshot. But he must have missed, or it had no effect on the creature. Several more nights, the townsfolk saw this thing. They blasted it with everything they had. Finally, on the fifth night, they believed it was coming from an old abandoned coal mine on the outskirts of town. And if just before daylight broke, it came back to that mine. The old brick and tile factory workers were working there. They had a posse gathered. They shot at it so many times, the newspapers said they could have sunk the Spanish fleet. But whether they were the worst shots in Iowa, or this thing was impervious to their weapons, it descended into the mine, and like a great Hollywood cliffhanger, that's where the story ends. We don't know what happened to this monster. I'm standing over the remains of where the mine was. No one knows if it was killed, if it's still there. Did it fly off to become the Mothman of Point Pleasant? I'll leave it up to you to visit because every year on the last weekend of September, the town of Van Meter hosts the Van Meter Visitor Festival, where you will get a chance to see the monster for yourself. The bad news is, we just missed it, but the good news is, that gives you almost an entire year to get your weapons in order to hunt this monster. Keep in mind, many thought it might be someone hoaxing the Van Meter Visitor. But the average height of an American male back then was only 5 feet 6 inches. In fact, the largest person ever on record was that of Robert Wadlow of Alton, Illinois. He died while still growing. He was a wee bit short of being 9 feet tall. They have a life-size statue of him down in Alton, Illinois. You can see how gigantic he truly was. Here I am on one of my expeditions over at Loch Ness looking for the Loch Ness Monster. I'm the one in the blue without the really cool beard. But little did I know if I wanted to see sea serpents, I should have stayed in the Midwest. Well, the Mississippi River that is. Back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, people were terrified of the Mississippi River. They believed man-eating fish were in the river. The sea captains came up and spotted these giant leviathan of the deep in the river, claiming that they were 9 feet long, 250 pounds, covered in a thick scale-like armor that a bullet could not even pierce. Parents were terrified. They did not allow their children to play down by the Mississippi River because they were finding men were drowning in the river, and they blamed it on these man-eating fish. The reason being is when they pulled the men out, they all had deep claw marks or scratch marks on their calves and ankles, as though something grabbed them, pulled them out to their watery grave, and drowned them. But then the newspaper said, don't worry, it's okay, you can go back to the Mississippi River. It's nothing more than a couple alligator gars swimming around. Which is all well and good when you don't know what an alligator gar looks like. But when you see that this is a garfish, it's a little different story. Because if a 10 foot garfish swims up against you, it's going to seem like a sea serpent. And in fact it is, it's just one that we happen to know about. Others believe it's something bigger and much more sinister in the Mississippi River. 
And you're not alone for the relatively small amount of small number of lakes you have in Iowa. You have a lot of sea serpent stories. Lake Okaboji, the Raccoon River, Spirit Lake, all kinds of weird giant monsters of the water inhabiting your lakes, rivers, and streams. Keep in mind Dubuque has the distinction of being the oldest city in Iowa, 1833. This next category, the stories were so bizarre they didn't fit into any known category, so I made their own category for them, including saloon keepers are liable for people being intoxicated. Believe it or not, in 1903 there was still a law in Des Moines about saloon, uh, saloon keepers being liable for people who had developed a drink habit. Mostly it was wives suing the bartenders and shop owners because their husbands could not control their drinking. Only in Iowa would you have this. I'm from Wisconsin. We didn't have this because everyone would be bankrupt very quickly if that was the law in our state. Or how about being duped by gypsies? This is an interesting case, and it talks about a man who claimed that he was tricked by a fortune teller out of his money. Well, that doesn't seem like something a fortune teller would do, but regardless, that's what happened. Lo notified the local authorities, they came out and were able to get his money back for him. They said if they got his money back, there'd be no charges against the gypsy or the Roma people. They also said that the gypsy camp was flooded with all kinds of gold and money, that it was a very wealthy camp. Believe it or not, this Algona Cemetery in the 1960s, your governor wanted to turn this place into a tourist destination. The reason being is one of the few known gypsy cemeteries to remain in the United States. When the Roma people moved through Iowa, oftentimes when they died, they'd be buried where they dropped dead. And of course, many cemeteries would not want them to be buried inside the cemetery proper. So they would create their own cemetery on the land is what, exactly what they did here. Of course, many believe this place is haunted. That the dare is, if you jump over or walk over the gate to get into the plot, you'll be cursed with bad luck until the day you die. Many believe that these gates, these iron gates, were put up to keep us out. But in actuality, they were put up to keep spirits in. The old beliefs were that Ghosts could not pass through iron. So if you wanted somebody to remain dead and not come back and seek revenge on you from the underworld, you'd put an iron gate around their grave or an iron bar on their casket to protect you from coming back and doing harm. Iowa has a long history of unique people in this state, including in Brit, Iowa, where they have the National Hobo Convention. Every year, hundreds of hobos from around the world, along with thousands of non-hobos, gather to celebrate the hobo culture. If you've never been to a hobo convention, I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. You can even sleep in the hobo jungle if you so choose. In Marshalltown is one of my favorite oddities, a place called the Death Chair. For decades, people have talked about this chair as being cursed. That if you go out there and sit on the chair, stand on it, or merely touch it, you'll be cursed with bad luck to the end of your days. Every year, I hear from a handful of people who claim that when they went and did the dare, they were involved in a minor car accident. They broke up with their significant other. They lost their employment. Even death is said to take place. We don't know anything about this chair. Cemetery records do not indicate who bought it, who it's a memorial for, or why it's there. But what we do know is that for many, many decades, people claimed that it is a cursed chair. 
After a recent program I did in Marshalltown, a woman came up to me and said that as a young girl, her Girl Scout group went out to the chair as part of a local history project. Of course, none of them wanted to sit in the chair except one brave little girl. Now, many decades later, they recently had a reunion for all of those Girl Scouts. All the Girl Scouts showed up except one woman who is no longer alive. Anyone want to guess which one? According to that witness, it was the same young girl who sat in that chair. You're probably thinking this is nothing more than superstition and folklore. But I've talked to so many people over the last two decades that have sat in the chair and had bad things happen to them that I'm at the firm conclusion that only a complete fool, oh, well, luckily or luckily, unluckily for me, the dozen or so times I've waited and sat in the chair, nothing bad has happened, knock on wood. Keep in mind the crookedest street in the world is Snake Alley in Burlington. Here's an odd case about a whistling well that was shooting up sand, stones, and water. I tried to find out what became of this well and there were no follow-up articles. And that was par for the course for a lot of these stories. They would make the newspaper splash and then never be followed up on. Keep in mind, in 1900, nearly half of the workforce was involved in farming. Today, that's less than 1%. I love this category. Don't worry, you're not going to see any of your in-laws or neighbors in here. It's too long ago. But does anyone recognize this location in Iowa? Sorry, bad joke, cornfield in Iowa. But you will recognize this when I tell you this is the spot where music died. 1959, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and J.P. Richardson, the big bopper, were all playing the winter dance party down at the surf ballroom. They had just finished the gig when Buddy Holly was upset because their tour bus kept freezing up and breaking down on him. So he hired a plane to take him and two other musicians to the Fargo, North Dakota area for their next event. The following morning when the plane never arrived, they sent out a search party. They didn't have to search far. Just north of Clear Lake, they found the crashed remains of the airplane. All three of the artists and the young inexperienced pilot were all dead on the scene. Some years later, they made a makeshift memorial for the artist and people walk about a quarter mile out to get to the spot where the music died. And this is where people have left their offerings and they take comfort and solace that the music of these artists will continue on forever. Just another weird Iowa bizarre event. Or what about this person crazed by his bride a young woman came over from Wales to marry an Iowa man, but as soon as she got here, he went crazy and started attacking his bride for some unknown reason. Not a very warm welcome to Iowa for this young woman. I wanted to see what happened. Maybe she went back to Wales or she met someone else, maybe a nice person, a nice suitor from Wisconsin that would not go crazy and attack her. Keep in mind the Kate Shelley Bridge and Boone is the highest double track bridge in the world. It's also thought to be haunted. I hope the old Pope did not read this next story because it tells of a woman who was given an inheritance. The only stipulation was she had to become Catholic in order to receive the $30,000, which at the time was about a million dollars. But she told the newspaper she couldn't do it. She could not convert to Catholicism. And she could not accept the money and say she converted because that wouldn't be honest. She felt like it wouldn't be the right thing to do. By the sounds of it, it looks like she didn't need religion. She was already a pretty honest and forthright person. 
So she did not get the inheritance. But don't feel bad. The money went to an orphanage, so it did go to a good cause. People in the old days loved to walk, not only for sport, but for exercise and sometimes just out of necessity. So let's say you were in a bar and someone bet you of how many miles you could walk in 48 hours. What would that number be? For some of you, a few miles, some others, a few dozen. Well, this next gentleman did 100 miles in 40 hours. He lost 15 pounds of weight because he was in a bar, of course, and with the dare, or the bet, was if he left at 7 p.m. in Waterloo, he had two days to make it to Dubuque. He made it with eight hours to spare. Remember, this was at a time when there wasn't a Casey's General Store on every corner where you could fill up with food, snacks, and beverages. Quite an amazing feat of that day. How about all these wild men that were seen out in the country? This one, they said, was of a gigantic stature, covered with hair, looked like some gorilla or large ape. And wild men back then were often described as being one of two types of things. One, that old vagrant that lived on their own out in the woods with their long whiskers, their beard. The other version, much like the one we just saw, seemed to be more of what we would consider a Bigfoot, a Sasquatch, a Yeti, a Yowie, the abominable snowman. Huge, gigantic, seven feet tall, covered in weird fur, walking upright like you and I do. Very strange, these wild men. What they were? Maybe a little bit of both. Keep in mind, the Red Delicious Apple originated in Iowa as well. Psychic phenomena. I love this category, and I have dozens of this next story where people could predict their own death. Oftentimes they had a vision that they were going to die. So they go around telling everybody in town they were going to die at a certain time on a certain date. And lo and behold, the person did die on that date of natural causes, not by their own hand, but they saw death coming and they saw it coming very quickly for them. Keep in mind, in 1800, the average income was only $380. This next budding hypnotist was stopped before he could do harm. A 16-year-old boy started hypnotizing friends at school, some of the younger kids. Teachers found out about it and stopped him before he wanted to break a bunch of bricks with a sledgehammer over their bodies. Luckily, nobody was hurt. This next case is really interesting because a husband and wife believed they were being hoodooed or cursed. Hoodoo was another way of saying somebody was cursing you through magic like voodoo. The reason they thought they were being cursed is all of the other farms in the area were producing a lot of milk and crops. Meanwhile, their farm was struggling. So they believed a neighbor, she put a curse on them and hoodooed them and they wanted it to stop. Of course, it couldn't be bad farming practices. It had to be a witch cursing you even in 1901. The last category we're going to explore today is that of UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Skeptics claim that the only reason people believe in UFOs, the only reason people see UFOs, is because of Hollywood. TV shows like The X-Files and Unsolved Mysteries, movies like Men in Black and Independence Day, that that's why we see UFOs, Hollywood has trained us to. But what you'll see here in this program is that people in Iowa were seeing weird things in the sky long before Mulder and Scully were out there investigating, including this story of an airship passing through. Now the date of 1897 is rather significant because in 1897 we had the largest flap of UFOs in our history. Thousands of people in hundreds of Midwestern cities saw these giant lights 
and ships fly over their community. You could follow the stories of these weird aerial monsters in 1897 as they moved from one city to the next. People would gather in a town waiting for the airship to arrive. Some say they even talked with some of the occupants, but they could not understand the language they were speaking. These stories continued on. Many times these weird lights would appear as spook lights. This one appeared in a cemetery in Monticello, and they talked about nobody would be able to find out what was going on. People used to camp overnight in the cemetery, watching for these balls of light. Back then, many of them referred to the lights as Willow of the Wisp. These mysterious lights that would dance about the community, disappear, and then reappear somewhere else in a matter of a few moments. Stories of UFOs continue to this very day. Every year, hundreds of new reports are coming in from people who have seen something they simply cannot identify. But as I'm running low on this program, here is what I hope you take from what you just saw. If you open up your newspaper, turn on the television, listen to NPR, or God forbid you consult the internet, you'll probably say something similar to this. The world has gone crazy. Can you believe how crazy the world is? And I agree with you. The world is absolutely crazy right now. But hopefully this program illustrated that the world was crazy a hundred years ago as well. It will probably be crazy a hundred years from now when they look back at us and wonder what the heck we were doing. So with that, if you want more information, you can go to my website, chadlewisresearch.com. You'll find more than you ever could want or need at my site. But I hope your adventure doesn't end here after the program. Grab one of my books, go on your own adventure of Iowa. And when you do, I think you'll discover that you live in one heck of a weird state. And I mean that in a good way. You're going to see things you've never seen. You'll meet some odd people. And along the way, you might just discover that the scariest thing out there is often yourself. So with that, I want to thank the library again. I can't think of a time in America's history where the library has served such an important role as it does today. With everything going on with the pandemic, societal issues, politics, the library is that fabric that keeps our community together. A real treasure for any city that has one. So in order for me to show my appreciation, if you are looking to grab a book from my site, type in the coupon code library and save 15% off all of my books. And with that, thank you all for coming and keep an eye out.